so what I'm what I'm planning to do for half an hour or so here is um, I'll just maybe give you a bit of a background on the company and and go through the story of sort of where we've come from um, and the journey that we've been on. It's been it's been a hell of a journey for about four years now. Um, so I'll sort of just go through the journey and the learnings that we've had uh, across the, the the journey. Um, I suppose the, the best place to start uh, is just in terms of what we do. Um, so basically, Storm Harvester is a platform that links drainage infrastructure to a weather forecast platform. Uh, and we started out selling just into individual sites. So we were selling controllers to link uh, individual sites to a weather forecast platform to optimize their drainage. Uh, and now we're selling it across utilities. Um, where we're at now, currently in terms of the business, um, you've probably seen in the publications there, we've just done our investment round, which was um, pretty close to 2 million uh, euros. That's just closed about a month. So as you can imagine, we're pretty busy putting new structures and, and hiring people and uh, uh, getting all the, the sort of growth underway that's associated with that uh, investment round. Um, we've proved our first product and I'll speak about a little bit about sort of the, the introduction of a first product and a second product and, and, and how we how we tackle that. Um, but we've got traction of our first product. We've got that's revenue generating in the UK. Um, we did a partnership deal uh, around Europe. So we're now selling that into 19 European countries uh, and we're in the, the process of doing further partnership deals for that first product. And then the second product that we sell to utilities. Um, we've got proof of concepts running in the UK. Um, we've got some trials set up for Europe and we're currently discussing a partnership agreement to bring that around uh, the world, uh, specifically uh, North America and uh, we're Australia and New Zealand as well. And we're in negotiations around that. Um, so we're pretty advanced, um, you know, uh, in terms of, of where we're at, uh, all being albeit that um, it's been about four years, three, four years, we, we've, we've had that uh, growth in. Um, and we're by no means there uh, yet in terms of where we're going to and where we want to go and where we want to take the business. Um, obviously, with doing the investment round, it's given us the ability to grow and to scale and to prove out in more markets and, 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 and add more revenue. Um, but I, I would, as I would see it, we're still pretty early on our journey. Um, of, of growing the company. Um, so, okay, let me start off then back at the very start. And I've sort of done some notes here just to remind myself of the journey and the different steps and the different stages. And maybe I'll try and layer some learnings on, on top of uh, each stage where we've gone and, and sort of what we've, what we've learned uh, along the stage. Um, so my background was uh, an engineer. I worked as a consulting engineer working in drainage Graduated in 2007 uh, and basically uh, was in one of the worst industries imaginable during the recession, 2008, 2009. Managed to hold on to my consulting job for one or two years post-recession, re post uh, but then got let go from my consulting position. Um, the only place at that time for work for engineers with a, that, that where there was access to visas, etc., um, was Australia. Uh, so I took myself off to Australia and started to work as a consulting engineer uh, over in uh, Australia, in Brisbane. Uh, and that was where I had the first initial idea for the product. Um, I, was, we were, I was living over there during the Queensland floods. I was seeing the devastation that was being done to the region during the floods. Um, and I, I, I sort of decided, OK, surely there's a better way to optimize these, the, the drainage networks and, and how they're, they're doing the drainage. Um, what I thought at that time was that I had an idea and I was going to be a millionaire. What I didn't realize was that the idea is about 10%, maybe 5% of the whole thing. It is not about the idea. It's about the work rate and the dedication and the ability to take an idea and actually bring it to a market and bring it and get it out there. Um, everybody, uh, like friends and family and, and a lot of my acquaintances, um, you know, when, they're, when they're, they're asking you about the business and what you're doing, they have this idea that you had an idea one day and now you raise two million pounds. Doesn't work like that. It's not. The idea is such a small amount of it. What I would say is that I probably have five investable ideas a day if you had the time and the ability and um, the, the access to the market and the knowledge of the market 
um, that's what's key. It's not necessarily just having that one uh, idea. Um, so the first thing um, I did uh, once the sort of the idea and the concept, I started to build uh, a really, really simple proof of concept. So we built like a really tiny system. Um, and um, I'm just going to share the screen here. I'm just going to, because I just want to show you how crap the idea was and what, what, we're, what we actually had at the time. Just wondering, can you see that? That is a picture of the first system. Is that showing up okay? Yeah, that's a picture of the first system that we had. And that, that photo was taken, I'd say, four years ago now. Um, so like we literally had a water butt and that blue thing is a tiny little valve. Um, and we were trying to link that to the computer in the background remotely and actually open and close that valve remotely. Um, and we were so naive, but so enthusiastic, I suppose, at the same time. Um, uh, and it, it just sort of hopefully that kind of shows you that, you know, that where we started is not that long ago. And it was very, very, very basic in terms of the, the idea and sort of the concept and what we started to build out, first of all. Uh, so I came home from Australia and I got a job as a consultant working in Belfast for one of the consultancy firms in Belfast. Um, and that was when we, we built what you can see on the, the screen. And that's in uh, your man there, uh, Dave, was a friend of mine. Uh, and that's basically in his garage. He knew a bit more about computers than I did. So um, basically, we got some money together and we hacked that uh, together. Um, what I did next then was probably one of the smartest moves. I went and I went to speak to uh, Invest and I. Uh, so I went in to Invest and I. We sort of pitched the concept of what we were doing. Uh, and they gave us a, a client uh, representative or a client liaison officer who really helped us uh, to sort of guide us in terms of what opportunities were there for uh, early stage companies and, and sort of, we weren't even a company, we were just, you know, a, a, a water button, a valve and a, and a computer at that stage. Um, so the next thing uh, that we did from that was that I approached the university in Queens. Being an engineer, um, I wrote off to the engineering department in Queens and said, look, I have this idea, we have this concept, I think it might be something. Um, would you be interested in helping it? Couple of, got pushed around within Queens a little bit and eventually landed on one of the lecturers in the civil engineering department, um, Dr. Pauline McKinnon. She took an interest um, and we started to do some work with them. They moved the system into Queens and there's myself and Pauline at the very early days, we were still a water butt, um, but at least we were a water butt in Queens at that stage. So that brought in itself some credibility. Um, so what we were trying to do by bringing it into Queens, we, we, we wanted them to help us test it, but more so we wanted some of the um, credibility that was associated uh, with having something in a university and having a university do some of the tests that we had already done. Again, we were very basic. It was very much proof of concept of the, 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 the very early stages of the, the system. Um, Invest and I then advised us to uh, go for a tech start POC. We went for our POC and um, the first one was we got rejected. Uh, and you'll notice as I'm going through the story here, there was so many times that we tried something, got rejected, and then went back and tried it again. Um, so the first one, we entered our POC, we got rejected, we got some feedback, and um, we went the next call a couple of months later, we went for the, for the, for the POC again. At uh, that time, we got the POC, and at that stage, the Techstar POCs were £15,000, um, which was an amazing amount of money to us at that stage, beyond belief. Uh, it meant that we could really improve the system, so we spent most of that on building a tech and building an internet platform uh, through which we were linking the system and actually having some sort of a user interface. When I look back on it now, it was probably quite horrific in terms of usability, um, but it was it, it allowed us uh, to grow out and get a little bit more credibility. The next thing from there, what we did was we went on and we pitched to Propel. Uh, again, Invest and I sort of pointed us in the right direction. Um, we got on, Propel at that stage was two phases, phase one and phase two. We got on phase one, first of all, and um, within phase one, they took you for, I think it was about three or four months, 
um, you had five or six workshops where they started to tell you a little bit about business. Uh, and then you had the opportunity to pitch for the full on Propel, which was 20,000 and a couple of months of mentorship. Um, so again, um, we actually went and we pitched and we didn't get on the first year. Uh, so went away, licked our wounds, started to engage a little bit more with the market, went back and then pitched again the second year. And then on the second year, we actually got through onto Propel. Uh, and this was where, this was really a game changer for us. We learned so much on Propel. Um, it was Diane Roberts was running it at the time. Um, and I still remember and go back to a lot of the teachings that we had at that time. So there was a couple of key elements that, that, that she taught us around business. So the first thing was, is your idea or your concept global and scalable? Is it possible for you to go all over the world without you having to be involved in every single sale or every single uh, uh, manufacturer of the product? And for us, it was. Um, the second thing was, are you there at the right time? Is, this, is, there, uh, is the market mature? Is it at the right stage? If you were a couple of years earlier, would you be too early? Or if you were a couple of years late, would you be too late? Um, and we, that's what we thought we were. We thought we were perfect in terms of the timing with IoT and, and, and um, all that sort of a revolution coming over a lot of different industries and, and just starting to look into to, to civil engineering and drainage. Uh, and the last thing was um, uh, the barrier to entry. How difficult would it be for somebody else to enter this market? Can you get patents? Um, you don't necessarily have to get them at that stage. Um, or is there something else you can do um, to put up a wall around anyone else? So if we, if, you, if we spend two or three years doing this, would a big industry player be able to come in and just roll it out in a couple of months? Um, and we thought that the amount of work and research and, 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 and understanding and development and potential patents that we could get um, around what we were doing would prevent one of the big industry players just rolling over us that quickly. Um, the third one then was market proof basically proving what you have in a small sub-segment. Um, some people call this a beachhead market or a subset market, but actually just taking what you have and saying, okay, can I actually make this work if I do some really, in really intensive sales in a really small catchment, a really small area, will, how many of them will I sell? Okay, and, and then scale that up to, okay, so if I just sold them in Northern Ireland and I can sell 100, how many can I sell in Northern Ireland, UK and Republic of Ireland? And then equate that out to all different countries around Europe. And is that actually a business? And is there a margin in that for each one? Um, and then can you actually build a business from there? So it's like quite straightforward. And, and you know, it's, none of this is, is really revolutionary, but actually thinking about it in terms of um, applying this to, to your business was really, really helpful for us when we were on the first, uh, when we were on that phase two propel. Um, one thing that I always remember from uh, the, the, uh, those courses that Diane did with us was um, she used to always give out to us that we were treating our business like a baby, um, that we wouldn't let anybody criticize it. We were really minding it. We wouldn't let it actually go outside of the room. We wouldn't actually show it to anybody. Um, and we were hugely protective of it. And that was the wrong attitude to have. You can't think of an early stage business like a baby. You have to get it out there. It's gotta be wrong sometimes to improve. Um, and you've gotta maybe disappoint some people along the way by not providing the perfect product. Um, but then you learn from that. And if, it's, and if the idea and the concept, and the timing are really good, um, you'll survive through that. Obviously you can't have some, you know, some major issues, but um, it's better to be out there and be a little early and not perfect than to be sitting in a room trying to perfect it and not actually get the market engaged with, with what you're doing. Um, one of the other really good learnings we had at that stage from Diane was don't expect anybody else to do what you're going to do for the business. Um, the work that you have to be willing to put into the business has to be above and beyond what anybody else would be willing to put, put into it. And you can't be getting an eye with other people that are working as consultants or starting working as staff as you bring on staff for actually working, um, for actually not working as hard as, as, as you're working or not caring as much about it as, as what you do. Um, or if you're you and your co-founder or, or whatever, whatever situation or whatever way that works. Um, so at the end of Propel, um, there's a pitch day. So we went and pitched to the great and good of uh, Northern Ireland. Um, and um, this was really good training because you can't imagine how nervous we were before this. And really, you know, 
it set the ground for us for many more pitches that we did that were much more important, but that seemed less important because we had been through the propel and we had the, the learnings from actually standing up in front of a room of, of you know, a business people from Northern Ireland and actually pitching the concept. Um, and I was lucky, I suppose, that day, but then the, the harder you work, the luckier you get, I think. Um, but I was lucky that day that I met that one of the people in the audience was a chap called Neil MacDonald, who uh, approached me afterwards. We went for a couple of coffees and Neil, in, Neil resulted in getting involved with business. And I would almost call Neil a co-founder of our business at this point. Um, he had some really good experience around startups. He had some really good uh, knowledge of the industry. He'd worked, he developed a consultancy, a successful consultancy in Belfast himself. Um, and the lesson that I would say around that is find people that can help you. People will help. People like helping. You'll, you'll have to pay them at some stage, but they'll do, they'll do a lot if they like you and they like the idea and they like the concept. And at the early stages, they'll do, they'll, they'll do a lot for free. Um, Neil still works with us now. He's, he's, he's a core key member of our business. Um, and we met Neil, when I met Neil, it was basically what you see on the screen there is what we had. Um, we had an idea, we had some market testing, um, but we were so early stage. Um, but Neil helped me to engage and to sort of build and to, to develop along with the market. Um, so after Propel, um, I went back doing some consultancy work and then part-time working on Storm Harvester, working on the business. Um, this was probably the hardest time that I worked on the business. The hours were crazy. Um, basically, I had to make money during the day uh, to pay for my life and the mortgage, etc. And then at the evenings and at the nighttime, it was storm harvester trying to get market traction. Um, so I used to work um, pretty much four days a week, three, four days a week as a consultant. And then in the evenings, I do a full day's work for Storm Harvester. So you might work eight to six as a consultant. You take two hours off until maybe eight or 9 p.m. And then I'd work through till maybe four or five in the morning and get back up again at eight o'clock and go again. Um, and you do that six or seven days a week. And I did that for nearly a year. Um, so if you're in this startup crack for an easy life or not to not to um not to have to have a normal job it's the wrong thing this will be harder if you're going to make it a success it will be harder than a normal job would be um the the level of work rate that's required to make this this kind of thing a success is it's beyond belief um and, and sometimes <laughs> i question my own sanity when i'm doing it um so the next along the journey, then um, the next thing um, we did is that we went back to TechStart again for another proof of concept. They had a second proof of concept scheme that they had released. We went back for the proof of concept again. We got rejected, but they said to us, you're probably a little too far on for the POC and you're probably more suited at this point to um, to go to a venture investment, but you're still a good bit off a of venture investment. Um, so at that stage, um, we had really to double down and that was a year of extremely hard work where Neil helped me for the year and we crafted and we got more market traction and we started to discuss partnerships with some UK companies around what we were doing. Um, and eventually at the end of that process, and I cannot explain to you how hard that nine months were, it was the hardest investment we've ever got in the business. We just raised 2 million euro. This was considerably harder than that because you didn't have anything. You didn't have any market recognition. You sort of everything you were beg, borrowing, and stealing to get anything done and to get to, to, to actually get products built and to get stuff out the door. Um, but then eventually, at the end of that process, we got an investment. We got one hundred and fifty thousand from TechStart, which was an absolute lifeline. Um, it brought respectability and credibility to what we were doing. We were no longer mad. Um, we were now business people. Um, so I went full time working for Storm Harvester then um, and I was able to pay myself a wage. I didn't have to necessarily, even though we did a lot of the time, but I didn't have to, to, to operate on three or four hours sleep that, that, that much. Um, but we bet that basically gave us a runway of about nine to 12 months. So we had to, uh, in nine to 12 months, 
actually build something then that was going to either be further investable or that would have revenue that would allow us to grow it. We reckon having revenue was a difficult one, so we we're going to have to pitch for another investment within nine months. So basically, from the first day we signed the papers on the investment, I stopped working as a consultant. The clock was ticking for nine months, nine to 12 months, um, at which point we needed to, to be in a position to raise more money. So we doubled down, um, spent a huge amount of time in the UK, really trying to hustle our early sales. Um, it's quite difficult at that stage because you don't really have a lot of brand recognition. The concept's still very new uh, and there's a lot of doors to be knocked on to make any individual sale. Um, we've definitely found as we've grown and our brand has grown um, that the amount of doors we have to knock gets fewer and fewer and the amount of sales, uh, the, the sale return from your pipeline gets higher and, and higher. Um, so that was, that was a, a challenging time, but certainly not, not, not harder than uh, the initial pre-investment um, because you had some credibility and you had some funding and you could actually pay people to do stuff instead of <laughs> begging that, that you'd pay them if you ever got money or if you ever got, got started properly, you'd, you'd pay them all back. Um, so through that period, we started to develop partnerships. Um, and we partnered with two UK, two of the leading players in the UK market. That in itself brought us some, uh, some, some traction. Um, we started to make some early sales. We got some, some very early small revenues into the business. And by the time we got nine months on, we were in a good position. And then we raised another 300,000. Um, that was relatively easy in comparison to the first investment because we knew sort of the metrics we had to hit. Uh, part of that came again from Techstart and part of it came from some angel investors. Um, from there, uh, things started to grow relatively quickly. Um, a big European player approached us for this product um, and they wanted to do a sales partnership. We negotiated that out and we did a sales partnership agreement with them. Uh, so we're selling our, this, that first product that we had, we're selling it now into 19 countries around Europe. Uh, at that stage, post the 300K investment, we decided we needed to diversify. We could see other market opportunities. So we launched a second product. And it was really lucky that we did because that second product was the one that saw us through coronavirus and allowed us to raise the, the bigger investment amount um, during uh, sort of the, 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 the global pandemic. Um, so for, we approached Invest in I then, again, keeping a good, good close relationship with Invest in I, um, and we got a 100, 100K grant to build out that second product based on our initial uh, successes and what we had done uh, with the first, uh, with, the, with, the, with the, the assistance and the, the early stage assistance they had given us, they could see progress, they could see we were starting to grow, we we're starting to hire people. Um, so we got a uh, 100,000 uh, grant. We used this to build out uh, our utilities product, which we now sell to water utilities. Um, we got some early stage uh, POCs for the utilities product. Um, we got that out and working and operating in the market. Um, and then we were approached by an international partner for that product. Um, and uh, we're currently in negotiations with that international partner. Uh, and we're, we're hoping that that uh, second product will be trialed in um, Vancouver, in Miami, in Brisbane, and a couple of other cities around the world. Uh, and the trials hopefully will be starting before the end of this year. That's all sort of currently under discussion. On the back of the progression of that, the rapid production of that product, um, we, we then decided we needed to, to, to scale and we needed, we needed some more growth capital to scale. Uh, so we went to the market, we started our, our outreach at about, at about November last year. I think I had conversations with 150 different investment groups or individuals or companies or venture funds. Um, we narrowed it down, or they narrowed us down more like it, um, to about six. Um, initially, we wanted to raise 750,000, um, but as our investment raise uh, uh, progressed, we were getting more and more interest. We were significantly oversubscribed and we ended up taking, like I said, um, nearly 1.7 million sterling uh, at, uh, in June uh, this year. Um, we were very lucky because a lot of that um, was done on the back of our second product, which we launched. Uh, our first product took a big hit during coronavirus because we were selling into the construction industry. 
um, so there was the sales were very were much more limited in that uh, area at that stage. Um, so, but the water utilities was an essential service. They were getting actually increased funding uh, from governments. So um, we were able to to leverage that uh, and the the trials and the partnerships that we were discussing around that. And that's uh, was one of the main things that allowed us to actually increase uh, our our investment around uh, and actually grow. Uh, in the time of the, the during the, the pandemic. Um, around the investment thing, I would say um, investment isn't always good. It may not be right. I we don't use the word investment in our in our business, in our company. I don't allow any of the guys to say we've got an investment. We sold some of our company to people that were interested in making a profit. Um, uh, I think there's there's too much glorification of the investment process uh, around startup companies. What you want is revenue. You want market traction. You want people paying you for providing your service. Um, really, what you're doing is your business is your most valuable asset, and you're selling parts of your most valuable asset as you go. Um, it is a necessary evil because you need to grow capital to, to grow a company. Um, but I would say don't take don't over don't don't take too much money. Um, because uh, you can't get that the, the business back. You're, ne you're, you're never getting that back. Uh, and ultimately, that's going to be your most valuable. Your valuable asset is the share capital of your company. Um, so that's where we're at now. Um, I think just to summarize the couple of points that I've written down here to summarize um, where we're at uh, uh, and the lessons that I've learned around the, the, the journey that we've been on. The key thing is work rate. If you're not willing to work, really work uh, hard at it, um, it's not going to be a thing. You're base, you're, in most startup companies, you're trying to create something from nothing, something that doesn't exist at the moment, and you're trying to put that out there and make that into a multi-million pound business. That, that, that just doesn't happen with an idea. It's got, it takes huge amount of work rate and patience. Um, I always say to the, to the guys, we have to be the most impatient people in the world because we want to have everything done today. We want to move forward. We want to get more sales. We want everything. We want the company to move forward. We want the product to be better. But then we have to have a, a high level understanding that this takes time, um, but we can't be satisfied to wait for the time. We have to push at a micro level. We have to be pushing uh, and be impatient every day to, to, to improve. Um, the second thing would be, um, I've I'd listened to a lot of talks and we were on a startup in, in, in San Francisco um, where we were brought over and we were brought to Singapore and there was some very successful entrepreneurs came and spoke to us. Um, Propel was really good for having successful entrepreneurs come in. I would say every successful entrepreneur um, that came in and spoke to us, um, when they left their room, the, th the main thought I had about them was, God, that person is a force of nature. You've got to be, you've got to just have that energy about you that's really going to push the thing forward because you're going to be the thing you're 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 the tidal wave that pushes and brings the whole thing with you as it grows the next thing the next lesson i've learned along the journey is you never take no for an answer so if we go into a meeting and somebody says no we don't come out of it and we say okay that's not happening we say okay what can we do to make that happen what what can we change um, who else can we go to? Who else is, 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 is doing something like this? Can we change? Can we adapt a little bit? Can we go to somebody else? Um, and it's one thing I say, everybody that we hire uh, before we hire them, uh, what, we, what I say is, I don't want you in here if somebody rejects something and you say, oh, okay, right, that's a pity now. We're going to have to do something else. It doesn't work like that. You just you just have to find a way. There's there's always a way to get past it or get through it, get around it. Um, and there's you can't have uh, the attitude because you're going to get no so many times along the journey. It's it's the word you're probably going to hear most, uh, or you're just not going to hear back from somebody. You meet somebody, everything went really well, and then you don't hear anything more back, or else you get a you know a, a soft no. Um, you just you can't be willing to accept that along the journey. Uh, and the last thing I would say is that a lot of this is common sense. Like there's no big revelation. There's no like book that you're going to read that's going to like change your world. W this is really common sense. Um, and if it's not common sense to you, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Like most of 
what you're doing in the journey, you know, I get really worried when entrepreneurs say to me, oh, I, I studied this book and this book taught me to do this. I said, if your gut didn't tell you or your mind didn't tell you or you didn't know yourself to do that, you're probably in the wrong game. Um, and that would be, sorry, that, that, that's, that's really it. That's maybe hopefully a summary of the story and where we're at uh, and how we got here. Um, I think the last picture that we had was the, from the little blue valve that we were selling, uh, uh, for, we made for the first day. Um, that's one of the systems that we put in recently to Hillsborough Castle. Uh, it's not even one of the bigger systems that we have. So we started out, if you imagine, um, that uh, valve uh, is controlling huge amounts of water and we're putting these into some of the biggest construction projects around the UK and moving out to Europe and uh, hundreds of people selling our system all around Europe now. We started off with that. The little blue valve there you see on the green water pipe, that was the first version of that we had. Um, and we've scaled and we've brought the technology up and we've grown it and that's where we're at now. Um, with the, the bigger system and, and obviously the traction and, and getting it around. So I'm going to shut up now and I'm going to uh, answer any questions if there is any questions or happy to go into any, any part of the journey or, or sort of um, hopefully there was, it was reasonably well structured and I tried to include most of um, sort of the learnings and, 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 and what we had along the way. Oh, super, Brian. Thank you very much. It was really um, interesting to kind of pack four years work into half an hour. So I really appreciate that. Um, well, a couple of questions coming through here, so we'll work our way through. Um, I suppose kind of while you're out on the investment hunt, how hard did you find it to also maintain the sales growth? You know, it's two jobs in one nearly. Yeah, savagely difficult. Really, really, really hard. Um, I don't know if there's any solution to it. It's just like, for the last, for the for, for the three or four months, and I think we were, you know, we were probably lucky and unlucky with the virus because the big is so the the first one was really difficult. I think I've explained why that was so difficult because I was still working as a consultant and and you know it's so hard to actually get the first investment. Second one wasn't too difficult because it was coming from some of our own existing investors and um, some angels and our own existing investors were validating it. And we had a good board meetings, six months of board meetings where we were showing our progress and they could see things growing. Um, so that wasn't overly difficult in terms of keeping the sales pipeline and the sales channels up. The last one we did this time was really difficult, um, which basically resulted in myself and Neil working seven days a week uh, for the first 10 weeks of lockdown, 10, 12, 14 hour days every day. Now, probably lucky we couldn't do anything else anyway. Um, but we were basically working two working weeks. We were working the working week to keep the business going. And then we were working the working week to get, do, go through a due diligence process with the investors, um, get, all, get all the information through. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's very encouraging once you get that far because you've got, uh, you know, if you, so you'll get a letter of offer on the investment um, and you're going through sort of the terms and the due diligence and you sort of know roughly what the number is, you know, people are in and you can see the, you can see the end line. It's still like it might be three or four months away still. Um, that investment process takes a long time. Um, but you can see it and you know that the number's there and you're just working towards it. So, um, you know, it's, it's harder maybe work if you don't have that deadline or you don't have that, that, that towards the end of it. Um, but it's definitely a challenge, but like I said, it's, it's just hard work and hours. That's, 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 that's all, that, that's the only way you can, I think, um, keep up, uh, your pipeline and your sales, but also ensure that the, the investment is, is there. And towards the end of the investment, you know, if you know the investment is coming, you know, you're not as concerned about the pipeline because, you know, you're, you're really trying to build the pipeline to achieve the investment at that stage. And then, you know, yes, you're always going to be concerned about your own pipeline and having that there, but um, you're probably hyper concerned about it in the first in the, the first three to six months when you're out looking for an investment or the first three or four months when you're out looking for an investment, because any drop off in that pipeline or those uh, revenues coming through on a month by month basis are going to worry and spook an investor um, until you get, you know, to a significant process through the due diligence. And at that stage, um, you know, they're, they're sort of in then and they've signed, they've signed sort of semi-binding contracts to say that, you know, subject to uh, anything coming out of the woodwork that we haven't dis discovered, um, the, the, the amount will be, will be named and the investment will go through. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, in terms of your product, you obviously have a bit of hardware and a bit of software. And you mentioned obviously being from an engineering background. Um, you know, how did you find creating that software, not being a, a software developer? Did you, did you outsource, you know, and if you outsourced, did that help or hinder the investment process? There, there's lots of debate around the table. We have this in Raise all the time. You know, yeah. how, do you, how do you develop something and how do you um, encourage investors to get on board with that? Yeah. Uh, that's really, really interesting, really good question. Um, right, hardware is a nightmare. <laughs> hardware is just a bloody nightmare. Um, if I had it over, we would do less hardware. And in the future, we will try and move out of the hardware and outsource the hardware. There's so much that can go wrong with the hardware. Um, on the software side, so um, I found a really good software engineer who worked as a consultant for us and helped us when we were building out the first software for the first 15,000 POC. And he was our first hire once we got the 300,000 pound investment. And he is still absolutely core. And I probably speak to him five to 10 times a day. Um, so we were lucky in that Trevor is his name. We were lucky that we got Trevor early. He was an absolute rock star in terms of building the product testing it, trialing it, and helped us, really, really helped us. Now, he was an outside consultant for the first year, year and a half, two years maybe, and then we brought him in-house. Once we, once we had funding, you know, enough money, once we had the 300K, we were able to bring him in-house, and he's with us now. He's working full-time with us and has done for about a year and a half uh, at this stage. Um, so it was probably a mix of both. We were outsourcing, but we were outsourcing to an individual who we trusted and we knew. Um, and then we brought on a second software engineer then in a similar role to work on the utilities product um, as an outsourced consultant. And he was paid for by the Invest in I R and D grant largely. Um, he was a really experienced top, top, top software engineer, uh, you know, demanding big bucks, um, which, you know, software engineers are, in like we're trying to hire three at the moment and it's so hard to get good software engineers and you know it, it's really um it's not the employer's market at the moment it's the employee's market in that area with the software engineers because there is a lot of software jobs around town um so we got stevie on board um and uh, we were able to pay him through the R&D grant and, you know, Stevie's been running for a couple of years, uh, we're working for two years with us now. Um, and, um, hopefully he'll be coming in house and, and, and then he'll be a, a full-time employee quite shortly in the next couple of weeks. Um, I think there's a lot of trust involved with the software engineers. I had a mate who was a software engineer that I was getting to check stuff regularly to make sure that, you know, constantly paranoid that we were going to be getting scammed um, and you know until you build up enough trust with these people that they're not actually going to to shaft you basically um, so I would just occasionally give blocks of code to one of my friends and, and give them a couple of hundred quid just to go through it review it comment it and come back to me and give any feedback to the software engineers um, and I suppose beyond that that was it we then we've outsourced some of our UX UI software development to uh, a company called Mint, who are absolutely awesome. Um, they've done a really good job for us around developing that. Again, there was a bit of trust there. Um, the local we got some, here in Bally Clare. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. We got some some good references for them. Um, we spoke to some people they had done work for. Everybody recommended them really highly. And the guys are, are brilliant up there. Um, they did a really, really good job for us on the UX UI stuff. And then between Stevie and Trevor and a couple of others, we've uh, built on um, the sort of all of the, the, the nuts and bolts of the system that's working beyond that. And uh, over the last three months, we've hired in five or six software engineers as consultants again, um, but uh, we're actively trying to hire now at the moment to, to ensure that we can bring all that expertise in-house. Um, so that would probably be, um, that would probably be uh, a summary maybe on that.
Yep. Yeah, super. Um, a quick question, just maybe where about your investors are? Are they across Ireland, the UK? Is there a mix? Sure. Uh, the, the lead investor on this round was a, a company called Green Angel Syndicate. They're a group of syndicate investors from London. Um, and then we got in with the, um, the old Halo network uh, from here to Clarendon. And Clarendon also invested in this round, uh, the match fund, the co-fund. Um, and then we have some angels from here. And then there was like three quarters of a million came from Green Angel Syndicate. So they were like the main party. And then the rest of it was made up from our, all of our existing investors went again. So they all put in a considerable amount again. Co-fund went again. Co-fund came in this time. And then there was Co-fund introduced us through the that sort of um, halo network to pitch at one of the, the, the Northern Ireland events. We pitched it. We met a couple of people there. Um, and they ended up part, coming in as part of the round as well. So the, the round ended up being a bit of a mixed bag um, in terms of who was there, but it was it was led significantly led by Green Angel Syndicate, who had a number of water utility people within their membership um, uh, who sort of validated it for the syndicate and uh, sort of they they knew the industry and, and they sort of knew where we were at and you know they did a lot of due diligence they did like four months of due diligence with us they went through everything with us um, but we're actually the biggest ever investment that they did which was which was pretty cool yeah I mean I think you touched on it earlier but you talked to an awful lot of investors and some picked you and you picked some of them so from the Green Angels you know did you decide on them was it or did they decided um, well we we went so we went over and we pitched to them and we did it like a 10 minute pitch on an evening um and they had all their members in the room we got enough feedback to go forward with them um i don't think that it was uh, like it's not a matter we, we didn't have enough investors that we were picking and choosing in the end we did it was kind of funny like we went for three or four months at the start and no one would talk to us it was like it's like until you had half the round, nobody wanted to fill the rest of it. But once we got like close to filling the round, we could have probably done three or four times more in the end. Um, but honestly, three months before that, we were sitting there going, Jesus, are we even going to fill this? Like, what are we going to do? Um, so there's like, I think with investors, there's like a herd mentality. Once you start to actually get some progress, none of them want to miss out. And then they all start to see, okay, he's doing it or she's doing it or they're doing it. And then everybody jumps on board um uh, like uh, they, they they didn't want to miss out on that um so we did like i mean even even text art like um jamie from text arts on our board and um i remember ringing jamie and saying that you know i've got a spreadsheet here with 150 of the names and i've spoken to almost everybody on on the spreadsheet now now he was thinking like this man must be insane like you you can't be, nobody's ever talked to that number of investors so i was just like we just have to um we just we just have to we just had to um we just had to, to get out there and and you know just, yeah yeah had, no had, it's done incredibly no. well so far so well done yeah um, well i suppose there was a question came through in terms of the patent and the ip maybe and the hardware and the software is it possible to even protect or you know um yeah that? so my i don't know about other industries my in terms of what we're doing we have large patents and not granted yet, but we're hopeful that we'll have at least one, maybe multiple granted. I don't think that they're going to fully protect it. They might scare people off, but I think realistically, um, if somebody really wants to get around the patent, there's very few that, that are absolutely bulletproof. I think if you're talking about like some of the people that are looking at this, that would be competitors of ours now would be in the region of six to 8 billion revenue. And those companies are going to find a way to get around that if they really want to. So our strategy was just um, a lot of trade secrets, a lot of what we do. We spent a lot of years developing. We're first to the market. We're before other companies. And realistically, if one of those companies want to enter and do what we're doing, it's probably easier for them to buy us than to spend a long period of time trying to negotiate around our patents and you know even with our understanding we're building a brand we're known as the first people to do this in the uk we're starting to do that in europe as well and we really protected ourselves around the partnership deals we, we we've signed um anybody that's partnered with us are, are, are generally the leading person in the industry that are that are sort of 
that would be a potential to 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 to, to sort of impinge on our IP and maybe, maybe try this themselves. And we've said, okay, um, we'll only partner with you if um, you can sign something that will say that you won't be uh, developing any any of this IP uh, for the period of our contract or a number of years after it. Um, so I suppose we've we've had we've we've lodged patents in that way, but they are not the be all and end all. Um, we've got trade secrets as well, uh, which I would say are probably more important to us. And then we've been clever in our partnership contracts that um, we're ensuring that any of the any people that we partner with, we're trying to partner with all the big industry players, and then we're trying to ensure that they can't actually develop anything themselves because we've partnered with them. Yeah, well, that's super. I was just having a quick look. Um... Just wanted to share this. Maybe um, you pitched one of our raise events back at uh, 2018. So there you are, Stir Storm Harvester. So we'll pull that one up for you for a bit of a laugh. That's hilarious. I know. I think it's back to that point of pitching. You know, it's it's like riding a bike. Once you get on and start doing it and practicing it, it helps smooth it out. Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I thought that was really good. Um, I think we had a few gins that night as well. I think yeah, that, yeah, that, that maybe helped the pitch. <laughs> Um, and yeah, um, question come through just in terms of your hiring. Um, you're hiring at the moment for roles in Lisburn. Is there, I mean, are you guys any particular reason for Lisburn? I mean, just outside Belfast. I mean, obviously now with remote working, what's your thoughts on that? Um, the reason for Lisburn is we weighed up lots of different options. Lisburn was cheaper, and I live in Lisburn, so oh, it, was all, it was also a good. <laughs> it was also a good good travel time for me. Um, we, we looked at a couple of places in Belfast, we looked at a few places out in from Hollywood, we looked out around Hollywood, and uh, we just decided in the Enterprise Centre in Lisburn was the most affordable for what we were getting with the most flexibility um, in terms of short contracts and yeah. uh, access to meeting rooms and stuff as well. And um, Do you think um, having a workplace is going to be key to, to team working, you know, even though people like working from home and you know that we've got zoom and everything i think um people still want to have a workplace to go and have the creative piece yeah yeah i think um i think there'll be much more working from home um and we're working from home is working really well for us and has worked really well for us uh like we we have a quick meeting every morning at nine o'clock with everybody a quick two minute how's it going what do you have today what's what's the plan okay and then we just check in across the day with people as to what they're at um and we've actually found that very good with consultants as well there's a few consultants that we've let go because um on sort of more than one occasion we want to check in with them and they weren't available to check in so like, okay well if you're not there and you're not at your computer you know i'll accept that once once it goes twice i'm skeptical if it happens third time you're gone um so we've had to do that a couple of times with a couple of consultants so as long as you know you're keeping everybody honest like that um i think um think that's uh that's key to it um but in terms of we'll be open to remote working going forward um we won't necessarily have to have people in lisburn um but what would be useful for people is that if there could if they could have access to the office yeah. um so you know if somebody is an hour away or, or two hours away if if we could have access to somebody in the office once every two weeks or once every three weeks or once every four weeks for for sort of some in-person team meetings you know we can accept longer travel time you know in that in that instance because they're not going to be there every day um that's kind of where we're coming from with it but you know it's very difficult to hire software engineers at the moment so um you know it's, it's not always the company's call it'll, it'll be as much the employee's call yeah yeah um, that's fantastic. A couple more. Um, I don't know if you can or be able to answer the question. You have a rough idea how much of your business you have sold in terms of equity. You may not be able to answer it. You say, yeah, um, too much <laughs> would be the answer. Um, yeah, like um, what I say, we're under confidentiality, so we can't give away the exact figures. Um, but uh, back to your point, you know, sometimes as you say, you need to sell, you need to sell the equity to grow the business, and having, you know, a small percentage of something that's very valuable is better than having a big percent of nothing. So yeah, exactly, and and you would sort of look at it. So the, so the thing we sort of learned, and we sort of maybe were what I wasn't doing at the start is like, if you're making a one or two or a three year plan of where you want to be in in one or two or three years, actually expect to be there. Don't think. I'm going to make this plan and then sure we'll see what happens like 
plan as if you're going to achieve what you wanted to achieve in the three year plan. Um, so uh, having that relatable to the equity question, um, there's still a sign there, there's still a there's still a significantly enough upside for to keep me and everybody else within the team motivated um, based on what we expect to achieve in terms of a, a, an outright sale in the next one to, to five years or one to three years. Um, so it's, it's really look at it in that metric. How valuable could this company be? And all sorts of companies have all different metrics for value. Not every company has the ability to be a unicorn. I don't think we would be in that ballpark. I think we're going to be bought by an industry player and I can see what those industry players buy companies for. I can see what stage they buy them for. And there's no reason to believe we'd be any different to that. So, okay, there's, so, so then I've got a, a ballpark outcome figure that I can work back from and I can say, okay, how much do I need to be happy with the work that I've put in for the last number of years? And okay, what percentage of the company do I need to own to, to, to achieve the number that I want? And then that's what you're working towards. Um, and also be very conscious of, um, there are some good government schemes uh, around founders relief and entrepreneurs relief uh, for founders of companies um, and tax breaks afterwards if you do sell the company if you founded a company you've owned it from day one you still own, own over a certain percentage of time when you sell it there's some some there's some decent uh tax breaks and and, and that things that you can do around that so just understand all that and and like i said plan as if it's going to happen because if you're if you're if, if you're making your plan towards it then it's silly not to plan as if it's going to happen and put put everything in place to as if it's going to happen like like I suppose when we were looking at doing the, the very first investment, when we were trying to put everything together for the first investment, um, I probably, uh, we probably didn't plan as if, if, as if we were going to get the investment. We were sort of going along and building stuff and, you know, we'll see what happens. And this is an interesting project. Um, but it wasn't probably until we had that conversation with Techstar where they said, guys, you're not a million miles away from a, from a VC investment where you're at at the moment. If you tidied up, you would get there. And we had to do a huge amount of backtracking and getting contracts signed and getting IP, ensure we owned all the IP. And there was so much legals we had to do because we didn't plan from day one as if we were going to get a, a VC investment. If I was doing it again, I'd be very careful of that. From day one, if you're planning to get the investment, plan as, plan as if you're sitting there on the day and they're putting the money into your company and run everything as if they are. Um, so have all your IP tidied up, have everybody that works as a consultant sign their IP over, get it all done legally, um, get everything tidied up along the way so that you're not having to backtrack when you actually get to that first investment. Yeah, no, that's really good advice, you know, just kind of getting the business foundations right so that you're ready when somebody's interested and it's already yeah. the hand over. And it, it can be difficult at the start when you're, when you're thinking, okay, why do I need to be signing NDAs with these people? You know, this is ridiculous. It's just an idea. But like get into the habit of doing NDAs with everybody you speak to. And, and you know, it doesn't take that long. Most people will sign an NDA. Um, and if nothing else, when you come to an investment, at least you've got a lot of due diligence documents that you can present to an investor. And that will actually make a difference that, OK, this person has been thinking of this like a business from day one. And there were, it's not just, you know, they've had an idea and, and, and now they're looking a load of money. Yeah, yeah. I have a question from Michael, who's our, our uh, resident politician in me, as he likes to talk about Brexit. Um, Michael's asking, is Brexit a bit of an issue to you? Or, um, not, re not really. I mean, what we're selling is very high margin um, product. So any sort of tariffs or taxes or anything that we might have to incur selling into um, the EU, is uh, they're not going to be a huge um, issue for us. Um, because our margins are, 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 are considerable. Um, I think uh, potentially if, if we were looking at selling, you know, more of a, a low margin product, so if we were talking about selling big numbers of a really low margin product, it might affect us more. Um, so I, I don't think that that's a, that's a huge, huge problem. Um, and I guess we could also um, have an entity set out of the border if we needed to, if, if, if anything like that became a problem. Maybe with hiring, it's a bit of an issue. We're starting to have a little bit of an issue now with visas and, you know, people that are in Europe, uh, software engineers that we're trying to entice over here. And they're a little bit standoffish because of the Brexit situation. And they don't know how that's going to go. And um, it's probably more on the, the hiring side, we felt, than the product side. Um, 
so I would say that Brexit hasn't been a huge issue, a huge issue for us. Like we did that partnership with the big European company. They're the biggest, one of the biggest infrastructure companies in Europe. And we did a 19 country European partnership deal with them um, just during and just after Brexit. And, you know, we were able to sort of reassure them that if there was any issues, we would, we'd be able to sell it from down south, depending on what way the, what way the arrangements went in Northern Ireland. But, you know, that's not our plan to do that. But, you know, if it absolutely came to it, that there is a plan B there and sort of reassure them around that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's super. Um, guys, do you have any other questions for Brian? He's uh, kindly given us uh, a lot of his time, but happy to have one or two more questions if there's any there. Um, one of the ones I know uh, that comes up quite regularly is probably a bit on the pitching and the investment side of things. I, ha I also have your deck from back in 2017. I'd be interested, just off the top of your head, how many times you think you've uh, you've rewritten your deck? Because... Um, we get that quite a lot from our from our guys. Here it is. Um, Jesus. I know. Um, that's horrific. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago was that? Uh, 2018. Wow, yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Uh, we got it all professionally done this time. Yeah. Um, for the bigger investment raise. Um, uh, we wouldn't redo it and redo it. We, uh, I would only we. I, I don't like to waste any time on it, except for when we're going out to investment. Uh, and basically every time we've gone for investment, like the first time we did an investment, I think I went into Techstart and I had a load of pages and I was yeah. trying to shuffle through the pages. I didn't even have a proper deck. I didn't even know what a deck was. Um, I was just, I, it was a shambles, like when you think back on it, but they must have seen something or there must have been something in there that they were sort of half interested in. Um, and then like that deck is like, that's horrific in comparison to what we have. All, right. now. We <laughs> all completely professionally done this time. We yeah. got meant to do the, the full marketing job on it. Um, really concise, very little words, more pictures. And, and, um, and then we did it this time. We did a two page uh, investment um, sort of a, a document or two page summary of the investment. So we kept the, we kept the deck, eight slides, all pictures, very little words only like bullet points and a couple of high level high level things um and we used that to pitch and then we had a two-page document that we got professionally done again um that had all the detail and the meat around it so what you were trying to do with the deck was you were trying to get an investor enticed that they wanted to hear more and then you had more ready straight away in a two-page uh, investment summary so we send both of them out together on a lot of occasions or any of the investors we spoke to i did re i did remote pitches with them with with the eight slides or ten slides very little words and then we did the then we followed up straight away with the two pager and that was our strategy uh, on that and that worked well yeah that, that's really good advice yeah no um thank you yeah Mary saying thank you very much and uh dan would be very pleased that you've given her a shout out so it's great to hear um, and of all that help that's going on in the background over the last couple of years is yeah in good stead so yeah i know diane was now we guarantee you we wouldn't be where i am now if it wasn't for diane and i learned more in the three or four months with Diane that I've learned in the three years since, I think. Fantastic. I um, don't think there's too many more questions that are coming through. Anything else, guys? No? Um, yeah, I mean, guys, um, quite often we would kind of just have a general chit chat afterwards, just kind of catching up and see if there's anything we can do to help anybody on the call um, in terms of connecting people to industry or connecting people across the call. I mean, happy, Brian, if you want to, to stay on and chat and join the conversation or um, if, you, if you need to dash on and keep working those hours, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll jump off. Um, but sure, once everybody is sort of back and, and the, the ability is to go in a room again, um, I'm happy to come in and sort of update on the journey and, and where we're at. And um, thanks to you guys as well for giving us the opportunity to, to, to pitch at the, that event the, uh, down in the, the Shark Cross Distillery, I think it was in. And um, it was, it was yeah, a good it was, night out, and uh, it was an it was opportunity great... to practice the pitch. So I was always interested to know if you got anything from it, but it's all always about the conversations more than anything. It is. No, we have we definitely had some really good conversations, and 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 what we found along the way is that like even in the last investment when we pitched that Halo, people had seen us along the way. So oh, I've seen you there a few years ago. You know, there must be something in it if you're still at it, kind of thing. Like, um, so I, I think we definitely got recognition and sort of you're just constantly kind of constantly flying the flag one one thing that i always say is that like 
I, I don't think I could point to anything we did that wasn't some help in some yeah. way. That like, that's just the most obscure stuff happened. Like we, I met this guy who had, who was trying to sell us, who wanted to be our partner in Indonesia or something. And he had this really awesome opportunity in Indonesia. And we spent a bit of time in it because we sort of, we were bought in by it and didn't really go anywhere. But he introduced us to the guy he was, he was a friend of the guy from the Green Angel Syndicate. So he sent me his details. And the Green Angel Syndicate guy about three years ago was in Belfast and said, oh, I got your details from such and such. And do you want to meet for a coffee? I'm flying out at 10 o'clock tonight. But if you come to the airport, I'll meet you for half an hour. I was like, right. Met him for half an hour at the international airport. Quick coffee. And um, ended up going back to him two years later because I had his email address. Because when we were doing our investment round, we put him on our investment investor pipeline sent him, threw him off an email and ended up having, you know, having a follow on conversation and then ended up, that's where we got our investment. And there was probably 20 other versions of that that didn't result in the investment. But like every, everything we've ever done, you know, we'll find some good in it somewhere, even if it's a rejection or we'll, we'll learn something. So it's like, you're always sort of learning and trying to be connected and, um, and then all that just takes time. It's just, yeah. it's just a very time consuming process. Yeah, building up those relations now is really important. No, thank you. Uh, it's been fantastic and really insightful and hopefully it helps some of the guys on the journey that are just starting out. So there, some of the guys on the call today were building products, some are selling and some are just, you know, trying to figure out what to do next with their idea. So yeah, it's really, really helpful. Really appreciate yeah. your time, Brian. It's been fantastic. No problem at all, Jenny. Um, I will, um, like I said, if, 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 if the world ever gets back to normal and we can actually come into a room together, I'm happy to come in and sort of give an update and go through anything else or anything at any stage and we'll actually get a pizza and a, and a beer. Yeah. Sounds good. Brilliant. Thanks so okay. much. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Bye. 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 Hey, Rob. <laughs>